Welcome to MHM Podcast Network on moviehousememories.com. Podcast for pod people. Our feature presentation begins now. And we are back with another Noirsville review on Noirsville.com. Our 30-minute reviews of Hollywood thrillers from the 1940s and 50s that are full of pessimism, menace, and crimes that never seem to go according to plan. I'm Chris. Hello, I'm Shane. And for today's episode, we are reviewing 1944's Murder, My Sweet, directed by Edward Dimitrik and starring Dick Powell, Claire Trevor, and Anne Shirley, to name a few, and a very big, large ex-wrestler playing Moose Malloy. <laughs> and for those of you who haven't seen the film, uh, Murder, My Sweet is based on Raymond Chandler's awesome 1940 novel, Farewell, My Lovely. And the film begins with Philip Marlowe blindfolded in a police station and recounting the events leading up to the deaths of Helen Grail, her husband, and Moose Malloy. It seems Moose had hired Marlowe to find his ex-girlfriend Velma Valento, which he lost track of after eight years in prison. And this leads Marlowe to the murder of a playboy named Lindsay Marriott, the theft of a $100,000 jade necklace, blackmail from a quack named Amthor, and deceit from those all around him. That's a pretty good summation. And was that guy really an ex-wrestler? The person who played Moose yeah. Boy, Mike Mazurki. Yes, he was. Okay. He used to be a um, professional wrestler, I believe. And he was a big guy, like six five. I mean, even in the book, uh, if you read that, the the guy is a large man, and I think they cast him very well compared to the to the book. Although this was based on the the book from uh, 1940, it did fairly well at the box office alone. Uh, it's it's not a true port from the book to the film, as many films never are. They cut stuff out to make the time frame. But uh, this one made 600000 at the box office back in the day. It won four Edgar Awards for the mis- from their Mystery Writers of America. Um, have you ever heard of those? Edgar Awards? No, I have not. Uh, I don't know if they're still around today, but it, this was in 1946. It won Best Motion Picture. John Paxson for Best Screenplay, Raymond Chandler for the author, and Dick Powell as actor. Your your uh, wonderfully favorite Rotten Tomatoes gave it a 93% <laughs> critics and an 86% audience. Have you read the book, by the way? No, I should have. I, I know that um, I was... It piqued my interest by watching mm-hmm. the film, but I hadn't haven't. I've read a few of the the Raymond Chandler novels, and I really enjoy them. But this particular one, I did not. Out of the Raymond Chandler novels I've read, I think this is my favorite. Farewell, my lovely. And I'm not sure if the story's not as the movie version's just not as good, or I'm just expecting a lot because I enjoyed the novel so much. But for me, Murder My Sweet is a tad bit of a letdown because. Uh, of the things that they have changed. I, I still enjoy this film, but I'm just curious to know what your opinion of, of Murder, My Sweet is, just based on the story alone, not having read the book. Yeah, I still think, without reading the book, that you can tell that there's a whole lot of Raymond Chandler's tone and vision, because it's a smart screenplay, uh, and it goes where you think it's going to go. There's some great one-liners. I, I just think I, I need more time to get used to Dick Powell. I have heard that he is one of the favourite Philip Marlowe interpretations, but in my view, I'm not. I couldn't take to him as quick as probably maybe other people do, and it's a different kind of movie. The way it starts with his blindfold, I did like the femme fatale side of it, and we'll talk about that. Claire Trevor is fantastic, but overall, it it's classic noir, but it's not what I expected, I guess. I guess Dick Powell does take a little bit of getting used to, especially if you're used to Humphrey Bogart. Yeah, uh, he does. And and he's also like a song and dance man. Not that that makes a difference, Dick Powell, but 
that's what I sort of envision him as. And then watching him in this for the very first time, because I'd never seen the film before, believe it or not, mm-hmm. always heard about it, but this is my first watch. Yeah, it does. He did take quite a lot of getting used to, I've got to say. I think for me, his tone and the and his narration fits uh, my vision of Philip Marlowe from the books a little bit better than Humphrey Bogart's. I mean, Humphrey Bogart's a very strong personality, uh, you know, especially if you enjoy The Big Sleep. Yes. Uh, because I think The Big Sleep as a film is stronger than Murder, My Sweet as a film. But I think that uh, Dick Powell does encompass his attitude a lot. And in some ways, I think I like his performance for that reason better. I'm one of those that think he, he does an excellent job in capturing Philip Marlowe's attitude, his cynicism, and even some humor. I mean, there's a couple of times where I laugh out loud just from his delivery of the lines. Oh, yeah. There's some really great one-liners here, and I laughed as well. Very well. They're pitched perfect. The femme fatale in this film is Claire Trevor playing Helen Grail, and or Heaven Gr- Helen Grail slash um, Velma Valento because it spoiler <laughs> alert it turns out she's one in the same. Yes, I like Velma actually. If I had to pick the two, what are the two? <laughs> that for a name or for a for, for her, a vixen? Yeah, well, just just for how she sort of switches mm-hmm. in personality, but. You know, I wasn't thinking of the name. It was more seeing you alerted that it was a spoiler. I just thought that was a great, great little twist. Were you thrown at the end, by the way? Oh, yeah, I think I was. I mean, I kept, whenever you're watching a noir, I'm expecting the unexpected, Mm -hmm. especially hard-boiled detective stuff from Raymond Chandler. I guess I was still a little bit surprised, though. I loved, Mm -hmm. loved how it ended. Yeah, I like how they handled it a little bit better in the book. I, not to harp on the book too much, but um, I was surprised as well the first time I came across this story that she was one and the same. But uh, the signs were there. And in this film, uh, she was very close. Moose was very close to seeing her. She she ditched Philip Marlowe in the, was it the beach club that they yes. were at? And so they were within a couple minutes. She went, powdered her nose and split. <laughs> but Moose was there. It was very possible that he could have seen her, and who knows what would have happened in that bar. Would have been a whole different scenario. Mm-hmm. He shouldn't have left me. He would have strangled her right in front of everybody. At one point, she was wearing this white dress, too, with a magnolia across her chest. Mm-hmm. Great, great costume. It was almost it was almost familiar to me. I'm not sure if maybe Barbara Stanwyck had maybe worn it in another film around this time or something, but mm-hmm. just it was a lovely, striking dress that you don't see a lot of in movies these days with that particular detail. Do you remember what she was wearing at the very end? I was more transfixed on what was going on, actually, because okay. it did throw me a little bit. Well, I'm wondering, a lot of these noirs... They'll start the innocent femme fatale off all in white, you know, virginal, innocent, and all that. And then by the end of the film, they're all in black. So um, I'm not, I can't imagine her in that end closing scene now, what she was wearing, if they went with that transition for her. I do know that in the film, she did transition into a, uh, I guess, a, a black and silver striped, uh, I, I don't exactly think it was a, I don't know if it was a dress or some sort of jumpsuit, but they did transition her going darker that way. So yeah, that's that's very right. It's sort of um, it was more of a formal attire, and uh, vice versa. The uh, the heroine Grail's daughter Anne, she at the beginning when Marriott was killed, I believe she was all in black, and then her clothing got lighter throughout the film. Yeah, that seems to be a trend. Yeah, uh, I did notice Anne's costumes as well but it does seem to be a trend in noir films it's, it's a good one though it's something that keeps the tone and the fami- keeps it all familiar mm-hmm. when you're watching these style of films because a lot does go on if you don't uh don't pay attention so they've got these visual cues did you like the narration in this because sometimes that can get a little bit overbearing i've never been a big narration fan yeah uh i think because they pulled off Raymond Chandler's style so well. I think it works for this film. But yeah, there's a lot of films that I can think of where that just doesn't work. 
uh, yeah. and omitting it can it can strengthen it. Uh, for instance, Blade Runner, uh, if you've ever watched the version where he narrates, I mean, Harrison Ford was purposely trying to make it bad because he didn't think it belonged. But yeah, yeah, of You course. can see Indeed. how, with that example, how it will strengthen it and just let you fill in the spaces. Yeah, and I like how when they adapt movies from a novel that's got so much dialogue heavy in it, you have to create a little bit of atmosphere and cut corners. So narration can help, it can enhance, but also, and we've said it before when we've talked about noir films, like you just said, you know, the the narration is very important if it's not overbearing. And no, I think they did it really well. Yeah, it was. I was comfortable with it too. So I guess the other lead in this was Anne Shirley as Anne Grail. Um, what did you think of her in this one? In the book, she was a little bit different of a character. I don't believe she was. She was the daughter of a um, police chief in the book. But uh, what did you think of Anne in this one? Um, I'd be interested to know how her character developed in the book because she was she was good in this and, and caught my attention, but I definitely think she was overshadowed by Claire Trevor. Mm -hmm. uh, I did like, she had a bit of a transformation throughout and she's a good actress and Shirley, I don't recall her in a lot of other things, but she held her own quite, quite confidently. I liked it. No, she was delightful. She wasn't a thirties, forties style, innocent, helpless victim. She, no, she was a, a pretty strong woman, I think. And she lived by herself, you know, so I did enjoy her character in this. And that's that's a different concept for this era. Someone who was like that, who lived by herself and so carefree, but also assertive. And that's how her character will like, fit right in, in the tone of this film. It's good. Did you like the car with the lightning bolt? I didn't pay attention to it, actually. <laughs> oh, really? It was a really cool car. I think um, it was a Spinto. I'm not real um, a car person, but I I just know that this car might have been was very similar to what's called a Spinto back in the day. I don't uh -huh. think they're made now, but it had this like lightning bolt and the roof. It was a really cool car. It would have been good to see in color actually to know what color it was. So there's great tension in a Raymond Chandler book between the police and Philip Marlowe. And I think that uh, that was one of the things that I really did enjoy about this one as well. The uh, mutual witty banter of dislike between Marlowe and Lieutenant Randolph. I, I think the, between him and Lieutenant Randolph, it, it was great. Yeah, I, I think it was Randall. Was it Randall or Randolph? Um, oh, anyway. I'm sorry. It was Randall. Randall, you're right. Yeah, I thought, thought it was. You know what? It's, it's homicide and it's blackmail. And the, the dialogue is crackling. I could have rewound it every now and then when they were exchanging pleasantries, as I'd like to call it, but they were almost unpleasantries. It, very funny, dark, but that's what it's all about. That it's That's what made this film for me, those kind of exchanges more, you know, because, I mean, we'll get into it later when we finish up, but it's not a noir film that... I took two straight away, but those particular scenes with the police and Marlowe, mm -hmm. fantastic. What was it that kind of turned you off then on this one? I guess maybe the Humphrey Bogart factor. I've seen the big sleep, read the big sleep more than, you know, five or six times at least. And there's different versions of the big sleep and they're all ingrained in my brain. And I think growing up, and this being the first watch as well, it was. It's just. I think I was maybe hoping for a more of a Humphrey Bogart type of Marlowe, but that's not what we get here. I would give it a couple more viewings. It 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 will definitely grow on you. I haven't seen the Robert Mitchum, who you said he remade this in the seventies. Yeah. I think that would be good because Mitchum is is a great actor and also did movies around this time where he was a detective and that that would work probably. Well, he's one of the best film noir actors. Yeah, that's not one I've seen either, but I'm sure that I would enjoy it as well. It's funny because although this is one of my favorite, this is going to sound hypocritical, it's one of my favorite genres, film noir and 40s and 50s films. I guess I've only really seen a handful of the main ones 
I haven't ventured off into too many others. And even though Murder My Sweet was a big film, you know, in 44, I, I don't know, I, I knew of it, but I used to get it mixed up with another one that was made in the 90s, actually, called After Dark My Sweet. I used to think that was like a remake of this, but it's a completely different film. That one has Rachel Ward and Jason Patrick. It's also a thriller suspense kind of noir-ish, but it has nothing to do with Murder My Sweet, but I always thought it did. One of the things that I did notice in this film was that for a film noir, there wasn't a whole lot of smoking. I mean, they were smoking, but it's not in your face as to... We've seen a couple film noirs uh, that we've reviewed <laughs> where I feel like I, my clothes are smell of smoke after just watching the film. But this one was pretty cigarette light, I thought. Yeah, I didn't actually notice, but you're right. Uh, there can be just it's smoking central most of the time during these films, but I don't remember recalling a lot of smokers in this. I think, though, when they do smoke in any of these kind of films, it makes it look cool, and that's one of the rare times that mm -hmm. I think smoking is cool. <laughs> well, there was one scene where it kind of drew me out where Marlo's talking to Amthor and he's blowing smoke out his nose, blowing it out of his mouth while he's reciting the line. And I'm like, oh, that's distracting. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what I'm thinking of. But you just said there wasn't much smoking, but I could only sort of imagine that scene in my head again. So mm -hmm. I think that one scene probably makes up for the rest of the lack of smoking. Yeah. I mean... There was the the cop did give Marlo a cigarette, uh, and the cop was smoking himself. But yeah, this was this is a smoking light noir. I mean, I love it how you see uh, in these movies doctors smoking in in the patient's room and stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Great, no regard to any um, lung prevention there. No, <laughs> although I did like when he was in the hospital where he's talking about the smoke, everything's smoky. And, yep. um, you know, that was a pretty good description. Yeah. Yeah. Now, look, now we're talking about it. I'm almost appreciating it a little bit more. But at the time, I, I guess I just was thinking of previous noirs I'm used to. And this one, it's because it starts off so differently, too, as I alluded to it when I first we started recording about the blindfolding uh -huh. and, you know, the flashbacks and that, and that's all good, but it just sort of got me off guard and, and started in a different way. Well, I think a lot of noirs, they grab you at the beginning and they don't let go until the end. This one, the, a good one does. Yeah. And this one, it doesn't do it the whole time. It does it a considerable amount of the time for me, but it's, it's a little bit different pacing, and I think it has to do with the way they handled the flashback in this one. Yeah, and I, and I I think the one line is to elevate this because you know they're just fantastic and the delivery of them and that great casting. Mm -hmm. I'm not aware of the director, uh, but he did a good job considering and did a great you know bonanza at the box office. So. Obviously, it was liked by the masses. Yeah, he worked up until, I think, the mid-70s. Uh, not necessarily major hits, but he, he worked for a long time. Yeah, okay. He's not a name that I'm familiar with, but I'm sure I've seen some of his actual films. He did a John Wayne film, uh, I think, like a year later, Back to Bataan. And uh, I know he's not... John Wayne films aren't on the top of your list, but that would have been one that uh, that you've seen. Yes, yeah, so John Wayne is sadly uh, lacking in my uh, repertoire, but I'm catching up slowly but surely. But no, he, he's got a lot of films kind of similar to this, so he worked very steadily I, through the 40s and 50s. Yeah, I, the name does ring a bell, but unless I looked him up, I can't pinpoint particular films that I would know him from directing. Uh, Claire Trevor, on the other hand, I am very familiar with. A couple of years later, she was in Key Largo, a small but extraordinary role. Um, Key Largo, of course, Peter Laurie and Humphrey Bogart and so forth. She's good in that. Yeah, we need Peter Laurie in this film. We need Peter Laurie in every noir film. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Throw him in because even if he was a cameo, 
he elevates any any film. He would have been great uh, for Amthor. He would have been a, yeah. a better actor That's true. for. Uh, it would have been a little bit closer to my vision of Amthor from the book than uh, what we got here. Is that right? So you could envision him after you read the book that Peter yeah. Laurie would work. Okay. Yeah. Well, Amthor in the in the book, he's more of a um, psychic, and yep. he doesn't really have. Well, the book combined three short stories, so in some ways they don't have anything to do with each other. So the Amthor part of it doesn't as much to do with the jade and the moose Malloy and such. Well, I'd like to talk about the locations as well around Hollywood and L.A. They weren't – you do see sort of more of a sprawling – cinematography in, in other noirs, maybe mm-hmm. in particular than this one. But what they did use were great. I, I just thought – I just really liked the atmospheric um, darkness and moody, the moodiness of it all around L.A. at this time. Mm-hmm. Well, they, they did it very simply. I mean, the way they introduced Moose Malloy, where Philip Marlowe yeah. was just staring off into the, the city's – uh, outside his window and you see moose yeah. in the reflection in in the darkness as an imposing figure uh, that was an excellent introduction for him yeah and that's cheap that's that's not smoking mirrors so to speak it mm-hmm. was just a, a properly set camera and angles and lighting and it wouldn't have you know that's not fancy special effects that's why I just thought I'd make note of things like that in this film because they had limited use of the cinematography, but mm-hmm. they worked it to a, to a hilt. Really enjoyed it. Good to look at. Yeah. I think in terms of just visuals, this was a beautiful film. Yeah, that was the highlight for me. I think the, di- the snappy dialogue and the visuals. Um, other than Claire Trevor, I'm still mostly getting used to the cast. I'm, I need to watch it again, Chris. Mm-hmm. Well, the actress who played Anne, she kind of, I think she quit acting after this film. So you probably don't see a whole lot of her films. Anne Shirley, really? Okay. Because she she seemed like she had a lot of potential. Interesting. And The Wrestler, I hope he went on to bigger and better roles. He was in It's a Mad, 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 Mad World. He was a Very funny movie. Um, (laughs) He was in Some Like It Hot. He had a brief little role. Overrated. Sorry, um, Lis- sorry, listeners. What about Donovan's Reef? Uh, well, it's another John Wayne film. Uh, yep, I have seen that, and it was all right. It yeah. was pretty good. I don't remember him in it though. Oh, he was in <laughs> Amazon Women on the Moon. Well, that's one of the greats, isn't it, Chris? <laughs> I love the film, but uh, yeah, he had a brief little role in that. So no, he 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 spread out that career for a long time. He did, yeah. We're considering this was made in the 40s and Amazon Women was the 80s. Interesting. And he died. He he died in, uh, I think, in 1990, somewhere around there. Well, in Murder My Sweet, he, you know, I'm not, I didn't sort of think he was a wrestler, but he was okay. And I'm glad that they cast someone like him that's realistic. Mm -hmm. You know, they could have gone with an, an actual actor that was big and it might not have been as prominent. So, I think that was a pretty good casting as well. Did you review Nightmare Alley with us on the golden age of the silver screen? I certainly did. It was a movie that I'll never forget. Uh, It's something I hadn't heard of at the time, but Nightmare Alley truly is one of the great underrated unknown films almost. Mm -hmm. He was in that. He was, um, uh, what the hell was his character? Well, we've spoken name? about him then because, yeah, I remember there was a big guy in that. Yeah, he played the the jealous uh, husband. Yeah. Bruno. Bruno's what he played. Aha. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, I do remember that now. So, yeah, big thug, uh, well, big dumb guys in many ways that don't know their own strength, I guess. Although I think he knew his strength in Nightmare Alley. but. Well, Ed Wood, of course, cast Tor Johnson in... Uh, Plan 9 from Outer Space, (laughs) who was an ex-wrestler. Yeah. Big dumb guy, but effective. Dumb but effective. That sounds rude, but I'm I'm trying to be nice. I'm sure he's a very nice guy. Yeah. (laughs) And listeners who are listening to this, if you want to look up our Movie House Memories Nightmare Alley podcast, do so, because it's a film that will 
you listen to the podcast, either before or after you watch the film, you'll want to watch it. Discover it. Yeah, Tyrone Power was great in that. Yeah. Anything you overly hated about this film? No, actually, I didn't hate anything, Chris. Uh, no, I I enjoyed it. I really did. Mm -hmm. But it just, it, it, afterwards, I'm like, mm, I had to think about it. And then there was, yeah, no, it needs a rewatch almost immediately for me anyway. I, I think I was just expecting it to go down, down different ways. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I didn't hate anything about it at all. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great film. Yeah. All right. Well, we've used up all of our time, so let's go around the table here. After all is said and done, on a scale of one to five, do you consider this film a bad one, or do you give it a high five? Shane? I'll give it a – I'll say it's not bad at all. It's good. And uh, I'll give it three trench, trench coats out of five. I enjoyed it, but uh, rewatch is essential. Yeah, I think that your, uh, your enjoyment of this film will go up the more – uh, viewings you have of it. I think it's bad for me to compare this to the book because they are slightly different in uh, how they went about uh, with the story. Uh, I enjoy the the book. The book is one of my favorite books just of all time in general. And it's my favorite of the Philip Marlowe books that I've read. But even having said that, I enjoy Murder My Sweet a lot. I'm going to give it four and a half, almost five. I'm, I'm going to do it Four and three quarters quarter trench coats. Wow, you're only missing a button. <laughs> yeah, I'm all, just a button. I I really do enjoy this. It's the more I watch Dick Powell at it, I think he I do get a very strong sense of Philip Marlowe and him. He's closer in size to the book, the character from the book. You know, Humphrey Bogart's only five eight. Dick Powell, I think, it was like six one six two. Yeah, so, he, he could tell he was a lot taller than Humphrey. So I think he had a presence. He delivered those lines great. And I do enjoy this film tremendously. Well, considering the book's got your high seal of approval, as does the film, I'm going to chase up the book as well and give it a read. Yeah, uh, I think you'll enjoy the book a lot. It, you know, because one of the things about the book versus this is that Raymond Chandler tackles some issues in a way that you just can't do for the censors in the forties. So he can be a little bit more descript, a little bit more graphic and uh, use some themes that they wouldn't allow in a film. So. Yeah. I often forget about the classifications um, yeah. variable, the eras. Yeah. All right. Well, that's it for our review of murder. My sweet, please let us know what you think of the film in the comments section on our website and rate it from one to five stars on that page as well. If there is a film noir you'd like us to review, please send us an email at comments at moviehousememories.com with your name, your location, and film choice. Until next time at Noirsville, I'm Chris. And I'm Shane. Bye for now. Thanks once again for listening. And remember, when crime and noir meet, things never go as planned. This podcast is not endorsed by Warner Home Video, and it is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. Murder My Sweet. All names and sounds of Murder My Sweet characters and any other Murder My Sweet related items are registered trademarks and are copyrights of Warner Home Video or the respective trademark and are copyright holders. The theme music for Noirsville In Your Arms is provided courtesy of Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Noirsville, the MHM Podcast Network, and Fuzzy Bunny Slippers Entertainment, LLC, unless otherwise noted. Oh.